Uh, okay, thank you for your question. First of all, maybe I would like to introduce myself. Yes, I am Andrei Konoplyanik, or doctor, professor, and so on. Well, uh, my current position, I am uh, advisor to the director general of Gazprom Expert, uh, let's see, which is uh, subordinate to Gazprom, its expert branch. In addition to this, I am a professor at the chair of International Oil and Gas Business, uh, Russian State Gupkin Oil and Gas University. In addition to this, maybe I will mention that we have such an institution, uh, Russia European Union Gas Advisory Council, and I'm a member of this uh, council, of this cooperative vehicle, and I have an honor and pleasure to co-chair with Walter Bowles, who is the head of the energy regulator from Austria Energy Control. We are co-chairs of the second working group uh, on internal markets in this Gas Advisory Council. So that's my introduction, and now coming back to your question. I think that it's not the crisis, uh, if you use this word, uh, or maybe the continuation of trying to find long-standing, uh, uh, through a rather painful process, trying to find new equilibrium in the relations between Russia and Ukraine, where these events are only additional events in the chain. Uh, it started, from my point of view, in 2004, uh, when first time, uh, before even the Orange Revolution, uh, at that time the candidate um, to uh, presidency of Ukraine, Mr. Yushchenko, has announced that they would like to follow a Euro integration path. And since that time, they're trying to adapt uh, the structure of the energy market to the European Union rules. Uh, in 2003, uh, second, uh, guess, uh, second energy um, package was introduced inside the European Union. It separated, unbundled market, capacity, capacity market and commodity market. It unbundled the vertically integrated company. So it was already quite a radical change. After that, Ukraine in 2006 has joined the Energy Community Treaty, uh, which does mean that now by law, by international law, by obligation being a member of this uh, organization, it needs to introduce uh, the European Union energy key, and Ukraine became the full member of this energy community treaty in 2011, since 1st February of 2011. That does mean that what we saw today is just, let me say, a continuation of long and winding road, if I will cite my beloved Beatles, or a long and quite painful uh, process of adapting the sovereign choice of Ukraine to the new realities. It was part of the former Soviet Union. Technically, economically, it is strongly linked to now Russia and former CIA states. And so to reorganize its economic structure, this takes a lot of time, a lot of money, and unfortunately, a lot of pain. Because uh, unfortunately, uh, this process cannot be done uh, quickly. So from my point of view, uh, it's uh, the situation that happened in 2014, starting with, uh, sorry to say this, with the coup in February, because I have quite a, my own strong political vision, not dependent on what other people are thinking. I think that was a coup on the 21st of February. And then, unfortunately, this civil war in Ukraine, because uh, nothing is worse than the war inside the country, that not helps to find the balanced solution to these uh, problems, how to best effectively adapt, it, uh, adapt sorry, Ukrainian uh, economy from being integrated inside the European, uh, inside the uh, USSR economy, and since um, the dissolution of the USSR being strongly linked with Russian economy, how now to readapt it or to change these economic ties mostly closely to um, the European Union, how to implement there are quite different rules in energy markets inside um, Ukraine because the rules um, uh, in energy markets uh, of Ukraine before it joined the Energy Community Treaty, the rules that were more or less common uh, with Russia, the rules, for instance, within the Eurasian community are quite different from the rules in the European Union market. So that's an objective difficulties. And so the war, the crisis definitely are not helpful in this. But we need to understand, and that's my point since uh, quite a long period of time. And since I have been working for six years, since 2002 to 2008 in Brussels, I was Deputy Secretary General of the Energy Chart Secretariat, one of these international organizations where all the European Union member states, including European Union per se, and Ukraine in my own country are the members, all these multilateral discussions, they have quite a, lot, a long history even in my personal, uh, let me say, uh, profession. I was trying to prove to all the parties involved the following. We cannot consider that European 
problems are the problems of the European Union only. European Union in energy is not, let me say, the independent player, like Ukraine or like Russia. We are all parties to what I called broader energy Europe. We are linked since 1960s by fixed, immobile, very capital intensive infrastructure. All these pipelines, all these grids, all these long-term contracts, and all this and all this. So that does mean there is no possibility to have best effective short-term decision, because that does mean that all this process has its inertia. Moreover, we can find only mutual solution. So the problem is not in energy between Russia and Ukraine. The problem in energy is not between Russia and European Union, not between European Union and Ukraine. It's the triangle. Uh, we all three are the part of this gas value chain that is part of this broader energy Europe, because broader energy Europe is much broader than 24 currently European Union member states. It's much broader than 24 European Union member states, plus eight countries that are the members of the Energy Community Treaty, mostly Southeastern Europe, uh, yes, Southeastern Europe, Balkan Peninsula, and Ukraine and Moldova, uh, who are to implement uh, by law uh, the European Union legislation. It's even broader than just geographical Europe, because most of the supplies that are coming from my country, from Russia, are originated from Western Europe, uh, from, from Western Siberia. So part of Asia is part of this broad energy Europe. Central Asia, it's not contractually connected with Europe yet, maybe. But it's part of this gas transportation system, former unified, united gas transportation system uh, of the USSR. And now, until maybe recently, when supplies to European Union uh, took place, uh, part of the gas that was um, uh, supplied to um, in Ukraine from Russia, it was only partly the gas that was produced in Russia, but a part of this gas uh, that was the gas produced in Central Asia that was then re-exported to Ukraine. So Central Asia is definitely part of this broad energy Europe. Northern Africa is part of this broad energy Europe. So that does mean that it's also, it's only possible to find this mutually appropriate uh, solution uh, on the basis which will create the common denominator for all the parties involved. As Philip Law, um, the former director general of DG Energy and former uh, DG uh, Comp uh, used to say um, uh, in our gas advisory council meetings, and we took this something like the uh, motto of this gas advisory council, we need to try to, at least, to diminish the risks and uncertainties to the tolerable level. That does mean on a multilateral basis. So that means that from my point of view, today's unfortunate development in Ukraine it has the influence both for European Union and for Russia. But one of the economic aspects of this painful transition is reflected in the following consideration. Since 1991, when uh, in the end of this year the USA has collapsed uh, or dissolved or disappeared, uh, we had the legal right, we as Russia, as the supplier, since, since that time we became independent states uh, with Ukraine, for instance, to supply our gas to Ukraine based on uh, not political pricing that existed before this, cost-based pricing, but on a pure economic market-based pricing, which means based on the replacement value, means based on this same pricing mechanism, so-called European formulas, at which we sell our gas to Western Europe and uh, to other countries that were joining this Europe. And until 2006, we were continuing uh, sell our gas on the discounted price basis. By this softening adaptation of our friendly neighbors, because for me it's very difficult to disunite, at least in my mental model, uh, the people who are living in uh, my country, in Ukraine, in Belarus, and some, let me say, areas of some other countries of the same nationality. Well, we were the part of uh, this same country, so they now have as a state sovereignty, but they are more or less the same people. So to ease for them the tensions, the problems of adapting to the new realities, we were discounting these pricing mechanisms which um, resulted in the low level of the prices since 1991 until 2006, only when uh, we began to adapt the pricing mechanisms to the European Union formulas when uh, Ukrainian leadership has stated that they would like to go through the, to the, towards the European integration. And so first in January 2006, we were moving to the European formulas. Only this smaller part of our supplies to Ukraine that was uh, produced in uh, Russia, 
maybe 50 percent of this. And only in 2009, we were finally moved all the volumes of the gas that uh, were supplied to the Ukraine to these European Union formulas. So it was a long period of softening the transition problems for Ukraine at the price or at the cost of Russian, not only gas producers, but in any case, uh, at the cost of Russia. And so now, since Ukraine is clearly saying that, well, we would like to be a part of the European Union, well, it's the sovereign choice of this country, whether I like it or not, whether my leadership would like it or not, but if they would like to go inside the European Union and would like to be a part of the European Union, then maybe it need not be Russia who need now to pay for this. Maybe European Union and maybe its allies and those who are standing behind us, they might take maybe a more important, more significant economic role in helping Ukraine to adapt to these realities. So not continue to um, supply the discounted gas, uh, it's so, which will mean the price um, of Russia, but maybe to pay the debt of Ukraine for the deliveries that were already supplied through the um, instruments, institutions, uh, where um, European Union has a voice, where European Union has the role. Moreover, to help Ukraine to invest into the diversification, into the diversity of supply. Because until now, Russia is the only one supplier of the gas to the European Union. It doesn't have alternative choices. In order to diversify, to have more than three alternative choices, which is now demand of the law, because Regulation 994 of the European Union that was issued in 2010, it's demand, it's required that each country of the European Union as well as the country that is implementing energy IQ of the European Union, shell, the meaning in legal language of the word shell does means that no questions, it's an obligation. Shell has at least three sources of supplies, and so on and so forth. Reverse flows, physical reverse flows at each cross-border points. That does mean that they need to invest in this. But Ukraine today is one step from being a bankruptcy. This one stage, you know, one step in the uh, credit rating agencies uh, a structure from the default rate. So nobody on commercial basis will provide money for uh, Ukrainian investors to invest into these alternative supplies. What is alternative supplies? Increasing domestic production, uh, developing LNG terminals, uh, developing shale gas, developing uh, uh, alternative um, uh, supplies uh, to gas substitute uh, from gas to coal uh, to other energies if they wish so. So you would like to diminish your dependence on Russian gas? Okay, that's your sovereign choice. But that doesn't mean that we need to continue doing this, helping you in this, by a discounting gas pricing. And uh, we, as any producer, has the legal right, supported by uh, international law since 1962, to obtain maximum marketable resource rent in our export supplies. There was a very famous resolution dated 1962, uh, December 1962, resolution number 1803 of General Assembly of the United Nations, uh, which says about permanent sovereignty uh, on energy, on natural resources, which says that the sovereign state, and we are still living in the world of sovereign states, and not in the world of trans transnational corporation, uh, so the sovereign state, energy producer, or natural resource producer, has the right to use it in favor of its own population. That does mean to collect the maximum marketable resource rent. What does it mean marketable? That the price of this gas, if you are speaking about gas, need to be compatible with alternative supplies. If there is no compatible, uh, competitive supplies inside um, Ukraine yet, that does mean that we can collect this uh, maximum resource rent based on the historical developments, which means oil indexation. That was invented in 1962 by our uh, friends uh, from uh, Netherlands, this very famous Groningen formula, uh, which definitely is uh, uh, considered as being the European formulas. So that does mean until our supply contract, 10-year long supply contract uh, is over, which will take place in 2019, and until Ukraine will not have the alternative supplies, we are continuing to use this monopoly position, and that's economic, that's pure commercial to obtain maximum resource rent. But in order to soften for Ukraine this continued transition now from Russia to uh, uh, European Union, we were ready and that was um, uh, one of the elements in this uh, so-called winter package that was signed on the trilateral basis between Russia and European Union and Ukraine on the 30th of October. We were ready to donate 100% discount from this market-based European formula oil index price. So that does mean that today, in this chain of events, we need softly but steadily 
move the financial burden for help in Ukraine to increase, let me say, its economic growth, stability, and so on and so forth, softly from Russia to European Union, since sovereign choice of Ukraine is to be part of the European Union. That's fine. But I think that the most immediate task, and that's non-questionable for me, is to use any opportunity that we as Russia and we as European Union and we as global community to help to stop civil war in Ukraine. Because no reform, no, let me say, economic, let me say, developments is possible within the state which is in a position of the civil war. So this, from my point of view, is a must, that the most immediate task within all these processes of long, sometimes not very soft, sometimes very painful transition of Ukraine as being a part of the USSR, then being an independent state closely linked with Russia, and then, according to the sovereign choice, moving from Russia to the European Union. That needs to be financed. Somebody needs to pay for this, but definitely not this country that was already investing a lot in this, and who is now becoming not a friend, but from which they are coming to some another alliance. There is the short-term task, the minimum task, and the long-term task of the program maximum. The short-term task, the program minimum, try to do their best using all the opportunities, bilateral, multilateral, to stop civil war in Ukraine. Moreover, I do understand that this civil war uh, in Ukraine definitely is destructive for all the parties involved in this triangle, both for Ukraine itself, quite understandable, because uh, in the war you cannot be uh, creating, let me say, economic wealth, economic benefit. Uh, but it's also destructive also for Russia, for uh, the European Union, not only because of the sanctions, but because I don't understand, uh, for instance, uh, for European Union, I think it's very uh, destructive because, and very negative, because it's just uh, uh, prevent uh, European Union to effectively move away from this economic crisis, from the, uh, from the recession um, uh, in which uh, state, uh, the global economy and uh, Europe, and my country as well, are still placed themselves or find themselves since 2008 to the now the nine crisis. And of course, all these tensions, political tensions, which uh, prevent or steady, effective, continued reliable supplies from Russia through Ukraine to European Union, which demand, for instance, European Union as a consumer to look for and to find the ways uh, and means sometimes more costly, more lengthy, sometimes less reliable than existing uh, Russian supplies of gas, that just diminish their competitive, um, competitiveness in the global market. So it's not only, let me say, the relations between the countries per se, that is the result of uh, this continuous civil war in Ukraine, but it's just, let me say, more global, more worldwide, more macroeconomic consequences for um, um, all the countries. Of course, the sanctions on my country, they have also negative effects, not so much, I will say, in the pure energy sector, but definitely financial sanctions, which prevent uh, uh, raising finance at the Anglo-Saxon financial market, they does matter. But uh, these sanctions also does matter for uh, those companies that are losing their business opportunities, uh, for instance, uh, in my country. So from my point of view, the first uh, token in these domino effects is definitely stop civil war because then you will prevent developing of these many, many, many negative effects. But in pure bilateral relations, as you have mentioned, Russia and European Union, I do understand that uh, there is uh, at least a number, a list of issues that um, should be mentioned, and I will start with my own country. What I think is a must for Russia? to understand that the current architecture of the energy or gas market in, say, the European Union, which is also to be implemented um, in Ukraine, uh, there is no return point from this. So we can like that package, we cannot like this third package. And since it was first announced in, in 2007, in September 2007, by the Commission, and I do remember this very well because at that time I had been working in Brussels and I have been, let me say, attending a number of these meetings when this was announced, it was immediately negative reaction of the leadership of my country towards this initiative because it was well understood at that moment that for the existing structure of contractual supplies of Russian gas to, say, the, to the European Union, third energy package as a totally new, radically new uh, architecture of the uh, gas market of the European Union provides new risks, new uncertainties, 
creates new problems. And it was not uh, well understood at that time uh, if there are potential positive elements that might provide new additional benefits for, for instance, external suppliers like Russia that can overweight these negative uh, developments, risks, and uncertainties for the existing structure. And it only now, only recently, after, let me say, more developments with the implementation of the third energy package uh, is taking place, uh, when through these channels of gas advisory council in our continued debates, uh, regular uh, debates on formal, but mostly on the informal basis, we begin to better understand how it will be possible to see the future developments of the institutional structure of the energy markets and how it will be possible to explain to our European colleagues how they need to take into consideration our justified concerns. We see that there are potential benefits of this third energy package that can create some business opportunities if the contractual structure is adequately adapted. So that does mean that instead of earlier position which is still reflected in the official position um, of um, some government sources of my countries, and I always, I'm always expressing my own personal views, non dependent, let me say, what affiliation, um, uh, what affiliation do I have at the moment? That's my personal views and personal understanding. Uh, that I think today we see slow, uh, and we need to speed up this process, slower understanding that that is a sovereign choice. And we need to find the new equilibrium, new balance within this new architecture of European Union gas market, based on the fact that since 2009, we are living now in the oversupplied European Union market, both contractually and uh, both physically. And uh, all this situation with the oversupply, they usually stimulates the liberalization processes. So European Union internal development of the Euro European Union internal market in the way how it's organized inside the European Union, that it will be a combination of market zones with the um, uh, virtual traded points in, in each of these market zones, with the strong interconnections between the zone and so on and so forth, they definitely create the risks for existing structure, but new opportunities for new structures. And since today we see the peak of uh, legal obligations of the contracted volumes of, of Russian gas uh, to Europe, or Russian um, uh, contracted supplies to Europe. And into the future, they will be softly diminishing due to the expiration of some of those contracts. That does mean that demand for Russian gas is still there. And that is, uh, from my point of view, clearly proved by a number of uh, analyses. The most recent one was this uh, nice paper that was published, uh, I think, uh, earlier this month by Oxford Institute of Energy started, uh, Studies. They say that despite the fact that the demand for um, gas uh, in European Union is stagnating, the decline uh, in domestic production opened the niche for Russian gas, the Russian gas will be there. But then the question, if the contractual niche is also opening, how, let me say, this demand for Russian gas can be filled? And my understanding that adaptation will be definitely there because in the future, supplies of Russian gas to Europe will be of two types. First of all, long-term gas supplies, not necessarily of the old type, old index purely, but adapted in terms of the pricing mechanism and so on and so forth, and of course, spot supplies based on the current architecture of the market. So understanding that it's not possible now to put the past back into the tube, that all these developments in the European Union markets, they are there and no return point is passed, that's a must for my country and that will uh, bring forward the finding of new uh, equilibrium. The same, as I mentioned, with Ukraine, but uh, for the European Union, I think it needs to be understood that all the perceptions, we're living not in the world of fact, facts, we're living in the world of perceptions. And definitely I understand that it was a negative domino effect that was created by these two very unhappy, unfortunate uh, crises, transit crises between Russia and Ukraine in 2006 in January and then in 2009. And uh, I'm usually using this formula when I'm speaking somewhere that 22 days of interruptions of supplies uh, that interruptions of transit supplies through Ukraine to European Union, they have overweighted the previous 40 years of stable and reliable supplies. And that creates the domino effect that now Russian supplies are not reliable. But the question is not the Russian supplies are not reliable, it's the Russian supplies through the Ukraine that are not reliable in Russia. That's why it's intended, its aim to continue being present in the European Union markets because we are linked with this 
fixed uh, in mobile infrastructure. Definitely, I do not see, uh, let me say, uh, diminishment of the interest between the two parties in the future, non dependent that there is a growing Asian market and Russia would like to add to this new additional, let me say, uh, demand for Russian gas to supply something to Asia. But Russia definitely would like to stay uh, here in the, in the European Union. And it's interesting to make its supplies reliable. That's why all these bypasses. Uh, outside, um, non passing through Ukraine territory, all this Nord Stream, Opal, Gazelle, which brings, let me say, um, uh, the gas to the same delivery points uh, uh, in the northwestern Europe, or South Stream, it needs to be built, uh, offshore and offshore, that bring, let me say, this gas to Baumgarten and then and to Italy. So the intention to uh, go, to bypass Ukraine is not intended to punish Ukraine. Its intention to continue being a supplier to the European Union with less risks. That needs to be understood, that Russia is not trying to use geopolitical weapon. Well, I do not like to speak about the geopolitics, because sometimes I think that when people don't understand technical, economic, legal background, they begin to speak about politics, geopolitics, whatever else. Well, I prefer, I'm an engineer economist, I prefer to speak about these three technical, economic background things, and this provides us an opportunity to find um, uh, the balance when we understand these substantial things. So, in the European Union, people need to understand that all these bypasses is not, let me say, to use this energy weapon. Is just, let me say, to reach commercial results, because we are as much dependent on the European Union as the European Union is dependent on Russia. So it's pure commercial interest to continue being reliable supply, to earn money, because unfortunately the structure of my economy, the economy of my country is as such that oil and gas provide almost 50% of all our export revenues. So that does mean that we would like not to put them at risk. So that does mean we would like to continue being a reliable supplier. That's why all these alternative pipelines is part of the com uh, concept, concept of the international energy security. In 2006, uh, I was still then working in Brussels, we were, let me say, investing in preparation of this agenda for the G8 meeting, that time it was in St. Petersburg, and for the first time um, through all these uh, previous uh, G8 meetings agenda, uh, the issue of energy, energy security was pushed on the agenda. And it was mostly discussed as the security of supply issues, but this reflects mostly, let me say, the consumer's view. And then it was additional point um, uh, incorporated into this concept of international energy security. Security of demand, providing more, let me say, predictability for the producers, for the suppliers from the demand side. And then we were adding there one other point, security of infrastructure or deliverability of this. So multiple pipelines concept as one of the elements of these uh, three facets in the international energy security concept. So we need to base on this, uh, let me say, background, the vision, what is secure? Security of supply, security and demand, security of infrastructure. That's why all these alternative pipelines are aimed to improve the security, energy security for European Union. Moreover, if additional gas is brought to the European Union, non-dependent, whether it's new gas or more secure, let me say, gas that is coming not through Ukraine, but uh, bypassing it. The more gas is coming there, the more stimuli for diversification, the more stimuli for improving competition within this internal energy market. So those are the lessons from my point of view that both parties, of course it's not, let me say, the full list, I'm just putting some elements, but at least what uh, both parties, Russia and uh, uh, European Union, maybe need uh, to reassess again, uh, to put it uh, on a higher priority uh, in the agenda, uh, and the trigger for this is definitely uh, these unfortunate developments related to the Ukraine.